Well, folks, here you are looking again at the Eosheen Falcon 210, uh, the Franken Eosheen Falcon 210. If you pay close attention, you'll see this is not all the original equipment. And you might be wondering, why, why, what, what could you possibly have left to say about this copter that you didn't say in the original review? Well, uh, I... <laughs> I've, I've made some changes to it, and I want to tell you about the things I've learned while I've been making the changes and just let you know what's going on with it. Um, I guess I can't leave well enough alone. I, I tried to upgrade the ESCs to BL Heli just to see how it flies, if, it, if that rig redeemed the copter in any way, because some people said it did. And, and you may have seen the video I made about how to flash these ESCs over to BL Heli using the C2 interface. Check that out if you haven't. And after I did that, the copter would not even take off. It kind of... It, it, its butt would go up, but its nose would not. It was very strange. I have no idea what was going on. So I said, uh, screw it. Screw this stupid, I don't know. And I took the ESCs off, and I took the motors off. And these are now, these are Bump B, BL Heli S ESCs. And these are Multirotor Mania Mini Titan 2204, 2300 KV motors, uh, which this is probably... The best <laughs> equipment uh, an Ishin has ever seen. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, and then also the camera was bad. So I just looked over at my shelf and I was like, what freaking camera have I got on my shelf? And it's this is the Runcam Eagle. Which So we have, uh, this is about $200 in gear between the ESCs, the motors, and the camera. <laughs> Them alone are worth about what this whole freaking copter sells for new. So, but anyway, I was like, I got to get this thing in the air. And actually, it is hovering now, and, and soon I will give it uh, some flight tests. Uh, but here's here. let's talk about what I've learned in this process. Uh, so one of the things I've learned is that the Runcam Eagle 16.9 version, the, the lens does not screw in very far. You have just a few threads, and, and the reason for that is that the lens needs to be far enough out that to focus right. I don't know. It's just how they've designed it. And the net result of that, I tried to install this camera, I did install this camera, on my Canis M4. And you may recall that on the Canis M4, there's like a plate with a hole cut in it, and the lens fits through there and then screws in on either side. Well, the pressure of that application was too much, and I actually freaking cross. I think I crossed, it's my fault, I cross-threaded it while trying to screw the lens in. And I actually stripped this housing. So I have a new housing on the way from Runcam. To Runcam's credit, they sell the housing for the Eagle. It's about nine bucks with tracking. It's about thirteen bucks. Uh, so that's a reasonable price to get a new housing for a freaking sixty-five dollar camera. Although I just saw it when I was on the site looking, it's on sale right now for fifty-five dollars. So uh, there you go. So if you have a Runcam Eagle, the sixteen-nine version, be really careful with the threads because the lens doesn't screw in very far. And if you cross-thread it and you strip like the first two threads, you got nothing left. Anyway, so that's something I learned about the e e Eagle. Um, I have been flying, very, very briefly, the 4.3 version of the Eagle on the Rampage frame, and I it's re full review is coming, but initial results are that it is much better. The, the problems with the Eagle that I noted, I think they have to do with the 16.9 lens and not the Eagle underneath. But anyway, more on that as, as it comes. These motors, 2300 KV motors, 2204, 2300 KV, they, they are not ideal for four inch props. In my opinion, tw higher KV motors are better for four inch props, even tri-blades. They'll do, and because this is a beginner copter, I feel okay handing this to somebody uh, and, and they're not gonna, you know, so they'll be a little underpowered, but for a noob, that's okay. Uh, no problem there, they'll be fine. I tried putting five inch props on this and they oh, they almost will go. You have just barely enough clearance here, and the real problem is back here in the back where the battery goes. The, the prop actually overlaps by about a quarter of an inch here, and it will hit the battery if anything remotely shifts. And um, also you got prop thrust being blocked by the frame, so I just didn't think five inch props were a good uh, choice here. If you were to cut down some five inch props to four and a half or even maybe 4.75 inches, you might do okay, but I've found that when I do that, it's really hard to get the props properly balanced and it's just not worth the trouble. This boxy style frame is okay in terms of it's gotta be stronger, right? But it's such a pain in the freaking butt every time I wanna work on something to have to pull out 87 screws and take the whole thing apart. And by the way, I feel like the same thing is gonna be true for the armadillo. Now, it's a little unfair. I haven't even finished the armadillo build. 
But as I'm starting to get the armadillo put together and see how tight things are getting and and I think about how much work I'm going to have to do to get in there and maintain stuff, I, you know, the, 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 the typical two-plate style, you say what you will about it. One thing it's got going for it is it's very easy to maintain. If you lift the top off, it's a few screws, it comes off. Many of the maintenance things you need to do, you can do without even opening it. If I even want to freaking get at the bootloader pads on the flight controller, I got to I gotta take seven screws out. No, it's not seven. You know what I mean, though. It's a real hassle getting all this off. Anyway, so I, I'm not, I'm, it's not my favorite. Speaking of the flight controller, so there's something I've learned about SP Racing F3 flight controllers uh, recently, and that is that if you try to flash an SP Racing F3 flight controller, and by the way, many of you out there are going to hear this and go, what are you talking about? That's not how it is for me. I'm all, all I can tell you about is my computer and my experience. When I try to flash an SP Racing F3 flight controller and I don't put it in bootloader mode, which you ought to be able to do, number one, it doesn't work. Okay, so sometimes it doesn't work and I don't know why. That could be my fault. But it actually, like, it doesn't brick the controller, but the controller stops booting. You can't even re-power cycle the controller and get back into the GUI. You have to, you have to put it in bootloader mode and reflash it. And th that's weird. Uh, I don't know what that is, but if, and I've tried this with the SP Racing in this board and the SP Racing uh, that it came with had this problem that I had to replace it because it had a bad gyro. And so there's a new one in here. I had the same problem and I just recently gave somebody a Multirotor Mania Mantis board that I had uh, and I flashed it to Betaflight. had the same problem. If you hit flash and you're not in bootloader mode, the flash doesn't work and then the board won't boot again until you put it in bootloader mode and reflash it. So I've never seen that before. It's really odd that trying to flash it corrupts it in some way. Anyway, I don't know. The transmitter that comes with it, the FSI-6, um, you know, for, what is it, 45 bucks? You could do worse for 45 bucks, but the gimbals are, they're pretty bad. And it's like, if that didn't have an effect on flight, then it would be okay. And you know, it's a, it's a convenience feature, it's a luxury feature, but there's sort of so much slop in them. I have like six points of dead band in here because they, they, they're they constantly jiggling even when the stick isn't moving between like, I don't know, 1495 and 1505 roughly. So there's a lot of slop in the, in the, in the pots even when the sticks aren't moving. I was able to get the end points uh, done correctly and if you have this copter, I have a tip for you. So this, this transmitter comes and you can't get at the configuration menus. This button doesn't do anything. And that's the, that's because you're dumb and you're a noob and you, you'll you screw things up. And <laughs> as insulting as that sounds, it's not entirely wrong. But if you want to, you can hold these two trim switches to the inside and power up. And you hear that beep? Now watch. Now the menu works. So you can go in and you can change things like your endpoints. Right, so I've adjusted the endpoints and the sub trims and all that stuff uh, to to uh, I, I, it comes shipped with aux one on this dial, which I don't know why you would do that. So I've moved aux one over to this switch so I can have auto level mode. Anyway, if you have this, there's a little tip for you as to how you can get the most out of it, get your endpoints, your sub trim, and so forth set correctly. So that's nice. Another thing to say about this copter is that it's very difficult to manage the OSD, and one reason is that it's all inside the frame where you can't really get at it. And another reason is that it has a custom connector, a little micro connector hooked up to it, which allows it to plug directly into the UART on the flight controller. But on the flip side, if you wanted to access the OSD with like an FTDI adapter to just to, to program it, you, you're kind of out of luck because I don't know, you could, I guess you'd have to unplug it and then you'd have to come up with some way to get the FTDI adapter on it. It's kind of a pain. Fortunately, Betaflight 3.0 has this new serial pass-through feature that I was able to use to access the OSD from the USB port on the side. It was a real lifesaver. And this comes with KVOSD on it, not MinimOSD. And so there were a whole bunch of things on the screen uh, which like RSSI and amps and milliamp hours, a whole bunch of things that are never going to get used because we don't have sensors for those on this copter. 
And the nice thing about KVOSD is that you can actually turn all those things off from within the OSD. In other words, you take the transmitter and you go center throttle, right and up, and that accesses the menu on the OSD. And then from within there, you can turn all those things off. And on, on minimum OSD, you actually have to go to the configurator GUI to do that. So I was able to reconfigure this OSD uh, pretty easily with a combination of the KVOSD configuration features and the, the Betaflight serial pass-through. I was able to turn off all that nonsense that it comes with that it's never going to use, just clutters up the screen. Um, so that's nice. That's something that I've done to kind of clean this up a little bit. Okay, folks, that's it. That's one last look at the Isheen Falcon 210, although you could hardly call it that now. It's got these BL Heli S Bump B ESCs on it, these multi-rotor mania mini Titan motors, and uh, in the fanciest freaking camera you ever saw on it. Boy, you talk about going from bad to good. There you go. Uh, I'm sure I'll give you a flight video just so you can have a perspective on how it flies. I hope it flies a whole lot better, although the transmitter isn't helping it very much, but eh, what can you do? Happy flying.